Good morning again. So the web can be scary, just like this very big room. So I returned to the web a few years ago, and the most difficult thing about it, about it wasn't learning about HTML, CSS, and you know, coding. That was actually, that was, that was fun. But it was how vastly different designing for the web is from designing a book, a magazine, a brochure, a film poster, or a, or a marketing concept, which is what, it's the type of things that I was doing at the time. So the design principles that you use when you design the interface of anything are the same, of course, but it was the planning, the different surfaces to fill, the innate interactivity, and above all, the role that users play that felt hugely different. And the hardest thing was to fathom how to organize all those pages that didn't follow their logical, non-nested, non-interactive sequencing of printed material. So the logic behind a well-built website seemed arcane to me, and I needed to work it out. And then I thought of UX, which, to begin with, to be honest, felt even scarier, because I had experienced the UX process when I was working at the BFI, which is the British Film Institute in London, and I was in charge of the creative direction when the web team uh, was working on a redesign with an external agency. So it was a really long and complex process, and it was incredibly interesting because I um, was involved in working with very large teams on both sides and large budgets as well. And it was illuminating. I learned about personas, I learned about user journeys and so on. And so a lot of the mystique behind it was sort of revealed to me. And I learned also what made the difference between a web project and a creative concept. Sadly, a BFI website is actually still as bad as it was 10 years ago, if not a little worse, because that's what happens sometimes with large organizations. So in a way, if you're smaller, you can have the edge, because changes are much easier to make. So when I went solar on the web and I had to work out how to create websites that held customers as well as the businesses, I asked myself, can UX help me? Can I find a way of adapting the process so that I can create websites that make sense, help the users, and also help the businesses by making sales or capturing leads? And perhaps even more importantly, can I do all this on a small budget and with a very small team, or no team even, or a team of one? Short answer is yes. So if you're a solo agent or a small agency looking to improve your processes, then this talk will really help you. But if you're a big guy who has, or girl, <laughs> who's worked with very large projects on, you know, with big teams, then it's probably of no interest, you already know, and you probably have um, processes that are much more complicated than what I can possibly show you. So having made this premise, what is UX? UX for some designers or developers and especially clients, small business owners, who haven't been involved in the process before, it can sound like a buzzword or a trendy term, or even though actually it's been around for a long time now because I think that Don Norman uh, at Apple created the first UX roles about at least, you know, I think about 20 years ago now. Well, what those two letters stand for, as you probably know, is very simple. It's user experience. So when we come to think of it, it's a really, really simple concept. But it's also essential because what is a website without user experience? It, simply put, it just doesn't exist. So whether you have thought about it or not, your website or your app or even your product will give your users an experience. It's as simple as that. And it's pretty much inevitable. So. When assessing the user experience of, a, of a, any project, there are three essential components to consider. So the first one is the look, because visual experience is essential to establishing understanding, together with credibility and trust, as well as the good feeling that beauty gives us. Then it's how we feel. Is it a joy to use this website and interact with it? And then how actually usable the website or app or product is. Predictably easy to use and, and 
um, functional as well. To be clearer, let's have a look at a few examples of users experiencing real-life products and having a good time or not so good time with them. This is an actual real bike path in the city where I live, Valencia, in Spain. And this bike path fail is not the only one, but it's for sure the most spectacular in town. And uh, uh, moreover, it's a tiled path, which makes for a, quite a bumpy ride at any time and very slippery when it's wet or raining or when they've um, cleaned the road, which, and I have the scars to prove it, I can assure you. So what emotions does this experience generate? Well, first of all is frustration, because we have to head back now, we can't go anywhere. The second one is bewilderment, because you're like, who the hell thought about this? I mean, how can you do this? And then the, the last feeling is definitely anger, and I don't need to explain that, I don't think. So if you had planned this experience, and if you had empathized with the users, you would have got a result that it's a bit more like this one. Ah, so, you know, this is a wonderful feeling of order because you knew exactly where to go and where you need to be and what the path is for. Then safety, because the cars are safely completely somewhere else. And then anticipation, because I really look forward to the wonderful event adventure ahead of me. So if you compare it with this other real-life situation, which actually looks like something that needs a graphical treatment, doesn't it? So therefore similar to a problem that we might be asked to solve as designers. So first of all, I think if I were to park here, I would definitely first feel overwhelmed, and then I would be, which would be followed by confusion, and then in the end I would just succumb to despair, because I would probably give up parking in this spot, spot altogether. I mean, there's no point. Compare with this instead. So here, I get an immediate feeling of clarity because I can interpret with certainty what I'm meant to do here, and then this all brings wonderful peace of mind. And basically, they won against the big guys. So the, the, the big lesson behind all this is ignore your users at your peril. So the online version of all this is, you know, vaguely in a rather daring comparison, is Facebook, because the final experience with Facebook is completely shaped by its users, and it's developed in ways that the creators could not possibly have predicted. However, just like the previous example, uh, this, is, this unpredicted organic environment is the result of a planned vision, and that's what makes the difference, because the vision behind Facebook was always to create user-generated content, so it's not a surprise. Because if you don't plan, it could go like this. This is my favorite website ever, and I invite you to also check the, uh, the code, uh, the source code. And it's a living and breathing example of a UX that's so wrong, it is actually right. Which can happen, because this is a website that is conceived to be utterly over the top, and it grew organically over the years, and it's animated and garish, and it really isn't about the users so much. It's all about Link, the owner. And it is completely unapologetic about it. And that is its strength. But I don't recommend following the example because she's, I mean, Ling is a maverick genius. She really is. And she turns everything to gold and not, you know, probably, I wouldn't say no one else, but very few other people in the world can get away with it. And her business is 100% solid. So she can do whatever she wants. But, you know. So in a nutshell, whether you've planned it or not, your users will inevitably experience your site. So while unplanned organic growth can and, and does happen, it's not the norm, and it, hands, it, it tends to happen anyway within a highly planned project that is used in alternative ways by its end users. It hardly ever happens when no planning has, has taken place. So the difference is that if you have planned your user's experience, you're likely to first of all control it, and then you give them what you want them to experience, and you're also highly likely to give them a better experience. So 100% fail to plan equals to planning to fail. So just do it, plan it, you know, and you can totally do it, anyone can do it, and really I maintain on any budget. So starting from the end, how do you know if a site are, how gives good UX? What are the benchmarks for that? So we already know uh, that it needs to have good looks and feel and usability. 
But then if you can answer these uh, three questions, does the site or application give the user value? Does the user find the site or, the, or application simple to use and to navigate? And does the user actually enjoy using the site or the application? It's very, very simple questions. But you can see immediately that there is one key word that we keep repeating here, fairly obviously, and it's user. So UX design is simply user-centered design. And Don Norman, again from Apple, first mentioned it in his 1988 book, The Design of Everyday Things. So the Color Traver projects, and elsewhere, because he does it in various places, and I have other examples that I'll spare you, all failed because the vanity of the architect and of the city planners were at the center of the project rather than the users. And I think this is the shift that we need to make those of us who work with small clients. Because smaller clients tend to think that it's all about them and their product and about their business. And while they're also users and they're humans as well, so they also definitely play a role, it's not all about them. It's also, you could argue mostly, but it depends anyway, about the end users. So this is the definition of UX design from the Interaction Design Foundation, which is brilliant, and I recommend it to you if you don't know it. And I'm just going to read it. So user-centered design is an iterative design process in which designers focus on the users and their needs in each phase of the design process. UCD calls for involving users throughout the design process via a variety of research and design techniques so as to create highly usable and accessible products for them. And by the by, actually, you don't need to even be a designer or have a design degree for sure to carry out much of the UX process as we'll see it. So in a way, the UX process can be adapted to a number of situations and not just web projects. So I think that this is what is revolutionary for a lot of old style designers, which I used to be. Um, instead of designing in our sort of ivory tower, we really need to get down and out and mix with our users. With one caveat, to be careful and, and maintain your role and authority as a designer, because you still need to be the one calling the shots, You're the, you are the professional. So for the UX process, there is a methodology called design thinking that can be extremely useful. It has um, drawbacks like anything and detractors, but I will go into that now. Uh, it's uh, very, very useful. So basically, it's by using a design thinking process, you make decisions based on what customers really need, rather than just relying on historical data or making uh, risky bets or guesses based on instinct instead of evidence. For example, a real life situation that came to me, a prospect saying that wasn't my client yet, saying we need to uh, increase our traffic. We don't have enough visitors to our site. And the traditional way of solving this would be to say, okay, well, let's do a Google Ads campaign or a Facebook campaign or look at other methods of you know, tra building traffic. But the design thinking approach is to ask why, which is also the UX design approach. The first question is always why. So when I asked, why do you need an increase in traffic? The answer was that they're not getting as many sales as, usu as usual. So the next question is, why aren't you getting uh, enough sales? Maybe you do get enough traffic, but not enough visitors are converting. So why does that happen? So in the case in hand, I actually uh, found out from the analytics that the website, considering it had zero SEO, zero anything, actually did get a decent amount, uh, number of visitors, but there was absolutely nothing for them to do once they got to the site or to come back for. The contact forms were buried. You couldn't actually tell what the website was actually selling from visiting the homepage. So the need wasn't traffic. It was on-page optimization. And without the initial why question, it would have been just easy to do what the client asked for and get them to waste money on, on, on ads or Google or, or Facebook. So then what I did is I ran a short survey of the, with some of the existing clients, which confirmed my initial uh, analysis, which was there was absolutely nothing for them to do, and it was quite difficult to find the contact form. And this is a boutique travel agency that only sells via direct contact. So they only talk to people that the sale happens offline anyway. 
Sorry, by putting the why question first and then asking the users, I got to the real problem. And this is what design thinking is all about because it's human-centric. Human it gives us a framework for the UX process and more importantly, it makes users make sure that we put the users firmly at the center of the process and that is empathy. So in the case of the website that I just mentioned, a short-term uh, solution because we were just not into the big uh, job yet without a redesign was to first of all change the headline and actually explain what the website was about, which is literally boutique walking tours on the Camino de Santiago. That's, that's all it is. And adding an immediately visible find out more button and a testimonial for credibility and social sharing buttons. So this still didn't mean there was anything to convert to or that the photos still involved the users in any way, but the experience of the users was immediately improved because we put them at the center while the previous homepage had been designed because they, you know, simply to the taste of the users or the business owners that liked the image and thought that that, that quote was so poetic. So this design thinking process that puts the users firmly at its center, it's built on five faces and they're non-linear. So I'm just going to give you a very sort of quick overview because it's a big thing. So the first phase is empathize which is with the users, which is instrumental in defining the problem. Then you ideate the solution and you prototype it and then you test it. So sometimes you will need, and this is the essential bit, you will need to go from the prototype back to the idea, or from the test back to the definition, or from the test back to the idea again, or sometimes from the test all the way back to the empathy phase. That is to say, we'll see, it's the research. So what I call the abbreviated UX process, because UX can be huge and you know take uh, humongous teams and have loads of really the testing is just another way of calling it and to me research is what takes up most of the time because if you do that well then you will have less going back and forth not that it's, there's anything I mean the going back and forth once you've you get to the testing is essential is, is the best bit about it and it's what I love as opposed to print because in print when it's done it's done you know you, you see a typo and you literally tear your hair out and there's no going back but with this it's fantastic because you can base your uh, you can you know improve the the success of anything just by going back testing improving optimizing and so on so this is how the two processes are integrated. So empathize and define correspond to research. Then ideate and prototype correspond to design. And then test and validation are essentially the same, the same thing, just the two ways of calling the same thing. Now, this may seem like a long and complicated process when we're dealing with smaller clients who maybe have never heard of it. So how do we sell it to them? Well, there are so many advantages to good UX. I'm just going to tell you a few of them. Here, so first of all, UX is a quality, quality measure. So it improves a business's reputation because the users are happy, but if they're not happy, then it could, it could really you know, break, be uh, much worse. So defining needs from the beginning, maybe this is the biggest one, makes it much easier to complete on time and on budget. And then it's much more expensively, obviously, to fix bad mistakes. And thanks to the research, you know what the competitors are doing and your product will be better for it. And no point building something that isn't needed because, you know, if you don't ask first whether your users need something, why build it? So just do it sometime. Just don't sell it. You, you could do it in a day if you want. It's perfectly possible to do the whole thing in a day. Just build it into the budget and do it. So also consider there is always two audiences in your UX process. And that's the stakeholders, which means anyone who, um, any business owner or manager or even sometimes employees that have a stake in the project on the business side, side and then the users. And you, we need to empathize with both. So in a big UX project, there's usually, you know, there's a big team, where, as I was saying earlier, where, where everyone, you know, there's lots of different roles and lots of different faces to it, but we can simplify it hugely 
to a team of one and still get great results. So the research phase um, stake is when you hold stakeholders interviews and users interviews. And you need to find out as much as possible about your client's uh, business and their uh, market. And you can do it with questionnaires or workshops, because in my experience, there's some clients who just say, ah, oh, I can't write, I can't be bothered to write. So what you do is say, okay, great. And you, well, let's, well, give me an hour of your time. And you, you, know, you do a Zoom call or you see them in person and you just run them through all these questions about their business. And usually when you ask, start asking lots of questions, so many things come up about the business that will inform the designer, especially if you keep asking why. Things like, well, I want, you know, like, always, like, I want a new website. Why? What's wrong with the existing one? Even the simplest declarations that seem self-explanatory always ask why. Even if you can see that the website is rubbish, it's not responsive, or whatever, ask it because it may always unearth things that you hadn't considered, you know, that the owner doesn't even know. So, and also another important thing to take into consideration, so I'm just going to do this, because this is where we get to the definition of the problem. By asking the questions, we get to the definition of the problem. And also, always find out who is going to be influenced by the changes, by the new project, because sometimes the business owners don't involve the employees, and that can mean a, a project failing when the employees actually either feel um, disgruntled because they've been ignored, or they use the, the, the product, the website, the app, whatever it is, on a daily basis, so they may have insights that the business owners don't have, and also business owners sometimes suffer from proximity blindness because they're too close to their business, so they always need to ask as many people as possible. Anyway, so, we're now in a defined phase, but also we need to ask, obviously, the users, to, uh, hold users' interviews. Now, this sometimes is a bit more complicated with small clients because some of them, what? Sorry, I just saw the time. <laughs> um, because um, sometimes, you know, a small, a small agency may not, or a, or a startup may not even have, actually have users yet. So just be creative. You can use uh, Facebook groups, you can use uh, with questionnaires and surveys, you can do workshops as well when you have the budget. And then um, uh, this will lead you to the user personas. But also with small businesses, ask the owners because often an, a small business was created by someone who was a user and had that problem. So they often can give you a lot. So. What you need to know in order to create user personas, and this is really, really essential. So you need to know the who, so their demographics. You need to know, even more importantly, the why, the, the, the emotions, the feelings, and what the, you know, the successful outcome that they desire. Then the needs, what do they need? And the solution, can we, how can we meet their needs? And then the flow, where do they come from? And what do they do when they get to the website? And then give them a name. Always give them a name and do whatever you do for them. So in the case of the boutique travel agency, who is Sharon, 55, North American, uh, retired, and so on. Why is really important. They have a burning desire to complete the Camino de Santiago to fulfill a promise made to a relative who passed away, but they're really worried they're not fit enough. And they also want to have a comfortable time. They can't, you know, they don't want to rough it out. So in the research, we get to the sitemap and the user personas. That's where we've got to now, just as a reminder. Then we get to the design, which is actually still the planning phase, so nothing to do with the UI yet. And uh, sitemap and user, so this is the, what the design phase means. Sitemap and user personas, user flows, super important, and then the wireframes. Now. This is what was done at first, because now I am designing with Sharon in, my, Sharon in mind. So it's still uh, not a proper redesign, but everybody can do the Camino de Santiago is what Sharon wants to know as soon as she go, gets onto the website. I'm talking to her directly. But we need to draw, draw them in, and sometimes she visits, but she's not ready to buy yet, however, you know, or even get a discount voucher, however big and bright we make that button, it's just pointless. So we decided that a funnel with a quiz 
was the thing to do. So we need to address all her fears and needs, and that can best be done with a quiz because no one can resist a quiz. And the answers in a quiz can really address the thing. Now, this is the really, really revolutionary thing, which if you've never done, I really encourage you to do. Because by doing, I mean, the sitemap is very useful, but when you put yourself firmly in Sharon's hiking boots, and you think, okay, she gets, she sees the Facebook ad, she's interested, but sometimes she's ready or not ready, so what happens if she's not ready? I have to sort of rush through this a bit, but you'll, you'll get the slides after. This is what makes such a difference, because if you do a flow like this, first of all, you will feel really, really sure that you've, you've considered all situations, and then it makes the actual design phase so much quicker. And then wireframes is what comes after the user flow, but which is you know an image or a set of images that actually is just everything goes on the page without the styling. You don't always need to do them yet, because uh, sometimes I, I do them when I have to hand the project off. But if I'm doing everything myself, there's no need. You can sp skip them if you're a team of one. Or if you use a page builder, because if you use a page builder, sometimes there's no point. You know, and with low budget clients, we often use page builders. So because I'm thinking like Sharon, this is the landing page for the quiz, because it, it will reassure her, her. It asks the right questions, and it has a photo that Sharon can identify with, and that triggers the right emotions. And then the quiz, uh, quiz itself addresses all of Sharon's fears and questions. She has, again, a photo that she can identify with and ends offering a free list of what to pack on the Camino that she will definitely find useful. Then the validation is where you test things. But again, you can test after you've launched. You can do that on a low-budget um, project. You can definitely do it. So usability testing on a shoestring or dead like guerrilla. So go into a coffee shop and ask people just randomly, can you test this? Even if they're not a target audience. But your partner, your kids, your parents, your colleagues who haven't worked on the project, your friends, their parents, their kids, anyone. Or Facebook groups. Facebook, Facebook groups are brilliant. I mean, in this case, I found colleagues that on, online who were 100% the demographic or her husband. And... Uh, parents, friends' parents, who were also the, the right people. And there are um, a few online tools to carry out usability testing. Some of them, you know, they, they, they're all, um, they do variously different things, but they're all super useful, and they're either uh, very cheap or they're free. So, uh, well, not free, but not all of them, but they're definitely cheap. So, also, bear in mind that sometimes five tests can give you the problems. You can already find out enough with five tests. You don't need that as many as you think. So, basically, the whole point about UX is that it's not a solution that's perfect straight out of the box. That's the whole point. It's precisely the optimization, optimization phase. So, that's why methodologies such as Agile or Lean work so well with, with UX, because deploy quickly, style it, deploy it quickly, and then go back and optimize all the time. So make sure that your clients are aware of this and don't expect perfection straight away as you launch, because that's probably not going to happen. But you get a solution out, then look at the data, go back and make it better. So this is, see the, you know, the design uh, thinking process? It's always about going back. So basically, Beckett said it right. Try again, fail again, fail better. Thank you. Can I just say, it? very yeah. quickly, there's a uh, Facebook groups group called Design for Geeks, where we talk about these things all day long. Uh, and also, there's a free U UX course coming up soon, if you're interested. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was even better than I thought before. <laughs> thank you. So we have time for questions now. Let's actually try with the same at WordCamp Europe, if you have ever been there. So we have one microphone over there. And if you have any questions, can you rise up and walk to that microphone and ask your questions from there? We also have this funny thing that we can just throw on you if you want to check that out. But if you have questions, can you stand up and walk right before the microphone? You must have <laughs> at least one. I do no have one, one backup question if you don't have. 
Don't be shy. You ain't all finished. You don't need to carry okay, I have one question. Yes. You, <laughs> I just need to make that up now. Uh, uh, you were mentioning about the user testing, and you yes. kind of already mentioned that it's it might be a little bit hard with the smaller companies yeah. or even the mid-sized companies because they don't have the resources to do that. And you kind of mentioned what are the other ways of doing the user testing. Can you kind of walk us through a little bit more? And another kind of related question on that is what is the biggest differences in kind of stakeholder kind of interviews and with the user interviews or whatever you do with those? Um, for the usability, I really think that usability is the scariest, scariest thing and I think that in a way it, it is the easiest thing because the, the, what we think when you think of, of user testing, people think of you know, big companies getting a focus group in a room and uh, making them test a product and so on. But there's, I've, I've been in focus groups, I've used focus groups and sometimes they roll out things that shouldn't be rolled out. In a way, it's much, much better to not have a focus group. I think it's an advantage. And look at, you know, I was mentioning the BFI projects. They, they, if you visit their website, it's terrible, and it still is. And it, they've been trying to improve it for 10 years, and they can't go past the focus groups and, the, and the, all the red tape. So user testing, really, get someone who's never seen the product. Please use a friend, even if they're not the user, the, the, the actual target audience, it can be even better. Imagine someone who doesn't have a clue about what it is that you're building, who for or what it, it is for. Put them there and say, what do you do when you see this? Do you understand who it is for? It's even better. And just like I said, I mean, I had to run through it because I was late, but um, anyone will do. And then if you want instead, if you have to test things that are much more specific to the audience, then Facebook groups, I mean, you know, love it or hate it, Facebook can be very, very useful. And I found so much help in Facebook groups from, and I actually did stumble upon my absolutely perfect audience. Uh, so it's, it's actually what seems like the scariest thing is the easiest thing. But to make sure that it's, it's always that you find people who are as far removed from the project as possible because you will also suffer from proximity blindness and it will be, become very difficult for you to understand what may or may not be working there. Oh yeah, and a state, diff, state, different stakeholders interviews and users interviews. Um, stakeholders interviews are really to find out about what's wrong with the business. Because even if it's a relatively healthy company, if they come to you for any reason, that means that there's always something that maybe wrong is the wrong word actually, but something that needs changing or that needs improving. And as you probe and you ask questions, things come up. I mean, in, in, it could be, for instance, that the uh, two business owners are not getting on, uh, or that one of them is really thinking of being hands off the business and sort of that's so that's why they're trying to build a different system. So that's what you need to do. That's your your task is and that's why the why questions always why, 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 and then always ask them to pick the their main why. Because when you ask why, as we were saying, the difference between the who's the, the who, the who is the the you know demo, demographics and the psychographics, when you ask why to a business owner it's also psychographics. You will find out what their successful desired outcome is, which the same thing applies to both users and, and, and owners. But with the users, it is a little bit more difficult because they are a bit further removed from you. So you have to put yourself in their shoes somehow. And it requires, I think, a little more, bit more empathy because you are kind of more on the client side that you are on the user side. So sometimes, of course, that's why people choose niches, because when you choose a niche, then you get to know, know them really well, and then you understand them a little bit better. I think there are dangers to that, because I think that actually you may find yourself, as I was saying earlier, again, the proximity blindness, or you may sort of be repeating the same solution for a certain industry, whereas different, even if it's the same industry, different businesses may have completely different issues.
Does that answer more or less? Yeah. Okay. It pretty much, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> if there are no other questions from the audience, can you walk or we can we have the microphone, let's test that out. Just throw it here. Hello. Yeah. Hi. Uh, I'm Antti and I would like to ask you uh, how would you use analytical data in the design, design process or does it have any value like Google Analytics or Hotjar? Huge, 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 absolutely huge value. I mean, this is what it's sort of the second phase. I see that this, this is the, a very abbreviated sort of story of the phase before launch. Um, but definitely, I, I don't. I I usually use someone external to do the analytics because that's not my strong. I don't actually want to learn, but it's it, it's it's such a complex area, and you need to get it right. You need to have someone that sets the goals correctly. You you choose a conversion or more than one. You you know set the goals in Google Analytics, and then you look at the data and you think, okay, this is. Uh, we guessed wrong. It, this was a guess. We didn't actually back it up with evidence. Obviously, it doesn't work, which could be, for instance, the type of freebie that you choose. It may be that the analytics show, you know, if no one downloads it, it means it's of no interest to the, to the end user. So, yes, analytics are hugely, hugely important, but usually it comes after. So, you launch and then, you know, start, deploy, optimize, and you keep going back and optimizing and seeing what works. In this project that I'm talking about, which is ongoing, it's live now, I'm talking to them right now, because I don't think, for instance, the big button with a discount does nothing. I think if I take it out, nothing will change. But there's another discount placed somewhere else, which is a pop-up when with there's in, when there's intent to leave, and that works. People go for it because they need a little bit more time. They're not going to press a button the minute they land on your site. Um, so I'm optimizing that as we speak, and I think I haven't used aggressive enough techniques to get there. You know, at the end of the quiz, I'm not forcing anyone to give the, their email address to in order to know the results. But again, don't be too attached to the analytics because even though a lot of people have completed the quiz, not many have downloaded the freebie, which is how we get their email address. But what I'm thinking is this type of people get in touch directly and now they've taken the quiz, they know that they can do the Camino, they've learned a hell of a lot on the Camino by doing the quiz, I think they'll come back. The fact that they haven't uh, we haven't got their email address now, doesn't mean that, that we're not in their, uh, you know, that we're not their favorite travel agency for the Camino yet. So, yeah. So, so, so I hope that does that answer the question? Basically, yes. <laughs> Analytics, yeah. very important with, a, with 